I come to bear witness that there is no other God but Jehovah and that Jesus Christ is his only son, a prophet and savior of the world. That there is no other name whereby men shall be saved but by and through the name of Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ the only son of the most sovereign, omnipotent God is Lord. Grace and mercy to the world and to my kingdom, brothers and sisters, peace be unto you and God be glorified. We are happy to be here this morning. And as Paul said, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Am. While we're here this morning giving honor and praise to a risen Messiah, there are some across the world that are preparing for burial. And in Columbus, in Sri Lanka, there was a eight bomb blast by suicidal terrorists. And of that, it was in a high-end hotel as well as churches. And of that, 207 people are now pronounced dead. And of that, many are injured. Some while at church, some while enjoying the luxuries of a hotel stay on this blessed resurrection day. So you can see that the enemy is not playing with you. You may be playing with him, but he's acting out John 10 and 10, where it says, for the thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. And the enemy is letting you know it can be on Jesus' birthday or it can be on his resurrection day or your birthday. Satan don't care. He's trying to kill, steal, and to destroy. And this is why we cannot be lackadaisical when it comes to Jesus. Because some of us that may have counterfeit conversion where you think you're going to heaven, you may wind up in a place called hell. And what God wanted me to let you know this morning as we move forward, we're still dealing with this series, No Limit, The Power of Grace. And God has given me a revelation on our Savior. And he has packaged it in a very, very interesting way. And I trust your hearts would be ready to receive. If you have your Bibles, turn away with me to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll be reading verses 2 through 3. Ephesians chapter 3 reading verses 2 through 4. Again, Ephesians chapter 3, reading verses 2 through 4. And the word of God reads and it says, If ye have heard, if ye have of this dispensation of grace, of God which is given to me, to you, Ward, if ye have heard of this dispensation of grace of God, which is given to me to you, Ward, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mysteries as I wrote afar in a few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And if you go back, to the book of Genesis chapter 3. In the book of Genesis chapter 3. 
And you read the word that says here in the book of Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, it says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto a husband with her, and he did eat. I'm going to use for text this morning, grace on the cross. Grace on the cross. You see, sin entered into the man and the woman, and therefore to the world. At this point, God started to move on his redemption mission in order to save man from his sins. In Genesis 3.15, the word of God says, and God says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel." This is the first mention of prophecy in the Bible spoken by God. God speaking of Yeshua to come and save man from his sins. God in his majesty and within his superintendent already knew that he was going to have to do something to help man to recover from his sin. So the first prophecy in the Bible is Genesis 3.15, and that was spoken of by God himself, his redemption mission to save man from his sin. Now the word grace was first mentioned in the book of Genesis chapter 8. The scripture reads and it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God provided his grace in the midst of a perverted world. You see, verse 7 says that God said, It repented me that I've made man. But what I love about God is right in the midst of your mess, he will provide grace. Amen. Thank you. And, the Lord, and, and, and as he provides his grace for us, we must understand that not only did Noah found grace in the eyes of God, but his nephew, excuse me, Abraham's nephew named Lot, found grace in the sight of God. That's Genesis 19 and 19. This grace was abounding before the law. What I want you to understand is that God had already set in motion his grace. When he set in motion his grace, it was designed to be a cleansing process or an antivirus. It was designed to get us to be able to live for God without shame, guilt, or fear. You see, the very center and the core of the whole Bible is the teaching of the grace of God. The gospel of grace is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Grace was before the law and the prophets. God was setting us up for what he know to believe that one of these days we was going to need his amazing grace. But we find in the book of Exodus, verse 8, grace was given to man, but 
the children of Israel, nor, excuse me, Moses' crew, said that all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And the moment they said all that God has spoken, we will do, God begins to roll out the Ten Commandments. Law begins to come in and take shape in people's lives. God gave 613 commandments, packaged them in 10, and said, obey them. No one could touch the mountain anymore. They could walk around it, but they couldn't touch it. If the animals touched the mountain, they would drop dead. And God told Moses to bring in all the children that he was going to speak through them, to them through a cloud and through a fire, letting them know that no longer are you abiding under my grace. But now, since you requested for law, you must have law. And the law was not given to them because they could do it. God provided the law for them because he knew they couldn't do it. But how many of you know that sometimes people that are arrogant and very proudful and very boastful need to be put in check? So what God did, he said, if you think you can do it, then keep all of them. Keep all 613 of them. And then he took him farther, took, took him to James, and James said, that even if you keep all of them and you don't obey one, that's James 2 and 10, he said you shall be guilty of them all. And what this simply means is that God was letting them know you need a savior. Because none of us can keep the Ten Commandments. Most of us don't even know the Ten Commandments. And on your best day, you still wouldn't be able to keep them let alone 613. So God was on a divine redemption mission to send Yeshua to save man from his sin. You see, in the same way that God is love, I want you to focus your mind on Jesus' grace. Let me say that again. In the same way that God is love, when you think of Jesus, you need to think grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 14 says this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. You see, in that verse is a trifactor. The first of that trifactor is the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second of that trifactor and the love of God. So if you got grace and you got the love of God, and the third of that trifactor is the communion of the Holy Ghost. You can't lose with that trifactor because you got grace when you act up, do crazy things. You got the love of God and you got the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, right by your side. So God in his superintendent was making ready to save men from Genesis 3.15. You see, God doesn't wait to save you as soon as you do something that is going to kill you. He's right there to save you. And when God sent his son to save you, he had to come through some things. You see, he could have had Messiah to come right away, but God cannot go against his word. How many hear what God is telling you? He cannot go against his word because if he went against his word and brought Yeshua right away to save man from sin, then he would have violated his word of the prophetic word that he said that he's going to, the redeemer is going to come and that he shall bruise his head and, and thou shall bruise his heel. When he spoke that into existence, he spoke into existence roughly 6,000 years, merely 4,000 years before Christ came. What I want you to understand is that God is always in control. 
And God is looking to save all of those that want to be saved. But see, when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, they brought in a contaminant. And that contaminant is sin. And that sin is a virus. And that virus can be coined as a disease. So sin is a virus. A virus is, in effect, an agent that consists of nuclei and molecules, a protein coat. You see, a virus is too small to be seen by light of microscopes and is able to multiply within the living cell of the host, that is, within a body. You see, a virus can get in and live within your body. It may not show up right away, but you will see the behavior of it later. A virus can come in and destroy you, and God was concerned about the sin virus that man has taken by eating of the doctrine of the devil called the apple or the fruit. But God in all of his wisdom in Genesis 3 verse 15 said, immediately I am going to send an antivirus. An antivirus is designed to detect and destroy a virus. Satan infected man with the virus of sin. And Yeshua Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, came as the antivirus to seek out and destroy all sins from generation to generation. You see, the virus that God, the antivirus that God sent out went through 13 covenants. The covenant of Adam to Seth, Enoch to Noah, from Shem to Peleg, Abram to Isaac, Jacob to Judah, David to Nathan. And as Mary said, be it unto me according to thy will to Mary. And Mary brought in the new covenant and the new covenant is called grace. So with, when God and his superintendent decided to save men from sin, God could not skip Adam and go to Mary. He could not skip Isaiah, the eagle-eyed prophet, and go to, and, 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 and go to Jesus. He, he had to go through to clean it all up. You see, God and the superintendent was interested in cleaning up sin from Adam all the way up through Mary and now to you. This is why it's important for you to accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Because if you do not accept Jesus, Yeshua Messiah, as your personal Savior, you're still living in the Old Testament. You're still under the curse. You are still abiding in the way of Lucifer. You're still fighting a fight that you can never win. You're still asking God to bless you without you first accepting Yeshua as your personal Savior and believing that God had raised him from the dead. Therefore, you now can be saved. You see, you can't have it both ways. You can't say, I'm living for the devil, and yet I'm living for God. You see, the antivirus has already been sent. Will somebody say amen? amen. Jesus cleaned it up all the way through. And how many know that he's looking to clean you up if you let him? Amen? amen. All you got to do is accept Yeshua Messiah as your personal Savior and let Jesus clean you up from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Now it's important for you to understand the only way you can receive the antivirus of Jesus, the only way you can receive it is that you must be able to accept Yeshua as your personal Savior. When you receive Yeshua as your personal Savior, you have now been vaccinated. 
you have now received your vaccination shot. How many people you know that are running around with all kind of disease in their bodies and have not received a vaccination shot? The same is true with Jesus. If you have not received your vaccination shot of accepting Yeshua as your personal Savior, in hell you shall lift up your eyes. Now, what is that vaccination shot? The vaccination shot is simply to believe. Help me, church. It's simply to believe. Do you believe that Jesus, the Son of God, came and died for your sins? Because if you don't believe that Jesus, Yeshua, Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach died for your sins. You can be in church and still be lost. You can praise him and it be no more than an echo. You can shout, but it'll just sound like noise. You can preach, but it'll be like banging cymbals. You can holler, but it has no power in it. The only way you're going to be able to get to God, and that is you must go through Jesus. John chapter 14 verse 6 tells us when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. It all comes, church, through believing. What do you believe? God is not going to make you believe it. God is not going to uh, make bad things happen to you so you can believe it. God is a loving God and all he wants you to do is to believe. But with belief becomes a corresponding action. I can't say I believe in God but yet don't pray to him. I can't say I believe in God, but yet don't fast so I can get myself together to be what I know God want me to be. I can't say I believe in God and I never read his word. I can't say I believe in God when I never come to church or, or I can't say I believe in God when I don't have him first in my life. See, when you believe in God, he must be first. He done told you that all through his word that he is a jealous God. How many of you have ever been jealous of somebody? And you know in your flesh you can act crazy when you're jealous. Just imagine God being jealous of you, putting everything before him. So it's important to believe. Can somebody say, I believe? You see, when you believe that Yeshua is the son of God, when you confess this and believe this, you are now saved. You see, the enemy... Want your mind. There is a war for your mind. Who wins the mind wins the man. Whomever you spend the most time with is who you serve. Who wins the war of the mind wins the man. Whomever you spend the most time with is who you serve. So if you believe that Yeshua Messiah is your personal savior... You should be spending time with your personal Savior. So the war is for the mind. Who wins the war wins the mind. And that is why what we believe we will become. What we believe we will become. What we believe. If you believe Yeshua Jesus is God's only son, who was raised from the dead, you will become as 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. The word of God says, for he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we may be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you take on the righteousness of God in Christ. In other words, there is a divine exchange. 
Jesus give you all of his righteousness and you give Jesus all of your sins. This is why when you confess Christ as your personal savior and you believe that God had raised him from the dead, there is a divine transfer. And that divine transfer leads from you going to Jesus and Jesus give you his righteousness and you give him your sin. Therefore, you are the righteousness of God in him. Will the church say, I'm the righteousness of God in him. But see, God understood that man couldn't keep the law, so he knew that the law had dominion over man. Fact about it, church, the law is a perfect document. There is nothing that is imperfect in the law. The law was so perfect that God knew an imperfect people could not live by a perfect law. So what did God do? Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6 verse 14. He said when you accept Yeshua Messiah, uh, you can live this life not through yourself but, but through Christ. Romans 6 and 14 says for sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law but under grace. Can somebody say I'm under grace? But Romans also 6 and 1 tells us. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And we have believers today that are just sinning and grinning because they're under grace. But verse 2 said, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Hear me, church. You must be accountable for the grace that God has given you. You must be responsible for living out a kingdom lifestyle while you are in grace. It is not permission, but the mere fact that you're sinning gives you an opportunity to be able to clean your life up. Why? Because God is looking at your life from a microscopic as well as a telescopic point of view. In other words... He sees it all. Why is this important talking about grace on the cross? You see, God in all of his wisdom knew that he had to do something different to save men. What I love about God is God doesn't think as a man thinks. God doesn't see things as we see things. God moves in his divine wisdom. And God knew that he was going to send Yeshua. He already knew that he was going to send him and he was going to be able to move in his life where Yeshua would come and die for our sins. So when we look at the chronology of grace on the cross, we will bump into the fact that Grace was prophesied to come in Genesis 3 and 15. God already knew that he needed to send his grace, uh, send Jesus to save man from sin. But what God did, God's son of man, and all of the prophets was talking about him. We got the eagle-eyed prophet. Isaiah said that he's coming. He's going to be a babe in a manger and they shall crucify him. And Isaiah told us 2,000 years before he came, this eagle-eyed prophet. But Isaiah did not tell us what he had in him. Isaiah told us that he was coming. So in this chronology of grace on the cross, we see that grace went through the 13 covenants in order to be positioned on the cross. Note here, Isaiah did not say that he uh, had something with him. He just said he coming. I mean, you know that sometimes you can show up, but people don't know what you got. He's coming. Grace, the antivirus of sin that came through the law and the prophets. What I want you to know, church, is that the prophet of old prophesied concerning Yeshua and Jesus 
that he was coming, but they did not know what he was going to bring. You see, sometimes people can call you to visit them, but you don't know what they're going to bring. The writers was talking about him as a man. They was talking about him as the son of God. They was talking about him coming through 13 covenant lineages, talking about him coming up from the stem of Jesse. And they was talking about him being connected with David, but they didn't know what Yeshua was going to bring. And it's amazing to me that God in all of his wisdom said, I'm not just going to bring Jesus to come and die for their sins. Help us, Holy Ghost. That would have been good, but God in his divine wisdom already know that there was going to be many that was not going to receive Jesus. He already knew by the mere fact that Jesus preached for three and one half years in the earth that there was many that was not going to receive his words. Many was going to reject him. Many was going to talk about him. Many was going to do bad things to him. So God had it all planned in the soup. The soup of Jesus Christ was within his body. God already knew that that soup, a natural, supernatural that was in him, had to flow out while being on the cross. You see, grace on the cross was in Christ. You see, it was hidden in Christ. Grace, the antivirus for sin, was in Yeshua. So even when they put him on the cross, they had no idea what Jesus was getting ready to do. They beat him with a cat of nine's tail, but had no idea that they was whooping grace. Lord God, they, they spit upon him, but they had no idea that they were spitting on grace. They lied about him, but they had no idea they was lying on grace. Uh, everything they did to him, they was doing to grace because grace was hidden in him. Have you ever been somewhere that you had something that didn't nobody know you had it, but you knew you had it, and you knew that what you had was for a greater purpose, and you knew that you being there was the obvious, but what you had was hidden. It was something that you could leave to the lead to the people that are there because they didn't know that you had something special on the inside of you, in your purse, in your pocket that they needed. So grace on the cross. They was looking at Jesus as being on the cross, but they did not see what Jesus had in him. Look to somebody and say he had it in him. Now, what I want you to understand as, as, as we go through this mystery, and we understand that Yeshua was not just on the cross. He, 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 he was not just going up the hill to a place called Golgotha. I'm here this morning to tell you, church, that was grace going up the hill. You see, and grace got beat, and grace got stabbed, and punctured in the side, and grace got... 39 latches save one and grace went through all of that for you. What I want you to know is that if the devil knew that if Jesus after he died that that would have been it, the devil would say that's fine. But, but see God, God is a strategist. Lord help us. You see he didn't even let the prophets know about this thing called grace until later on. He didn't even begin to let the rhythm of it come out because he said somebody may leak this out. So what they was looking at was just a sacrifice, a body. They was looking for the body because in the body was, he said he was bruised for your iniquity. The chastisement of your peace was upon him. And with his bodily stripes, you are healed. Oh! You see, God was so masterful. He was so surgical. He was so strategic to put something on the inside of him. 
He said, I got to hide this mystery. I got I to gotta put it in him so nobody would be able to reveal it until I want it to be revealed. So what did God say? He said, you can beat this body. You can crucify this body. You can talk about this body. This body is just a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice for those that accept Jesus as their personal savior. They shall be saved. But now that they're saved, now what? How do I continue to live a saved life from the cross if grace is not with Jesus on the cross? He said they got to be saved, but then they got to live. They got to be saved, but then they got to walk it out. They got to be saved, but then they got to know how to love. They got to be saved, but then they got to know that I love them even when they mess up. So grace on the cross, hitting in the body and the flesh of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, gives us right to have everlasting life. Look to your neighbor and say grace on the cross. See, the devil didn't know this. He, he didn't know this. He didn't know God not only is strategic, but he's surgical. He didn't know that what is a mystery to man is divine wisdom to God. You see, years ago, the people used to say that God moves in mysterious ways. Uh, he don't move in mysterious ways. He move in his way, and it's mysterious to you because you don't know his ways. We serve a God that had it all planned out. A serve a God said, you can beat this body, but I got more. Oh, Lord, help us. Or you can spit on him, but I got more. See, God, superintendent was, he said that I would that none would perish, but that all would come to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So to die on the cross was not the ending. To die on the cross was the beginning for those that want to accept Yeshua as their personal Savior. When he died on the cross, he gave us his grace. So when he said it is finished, he was right. When he said it is finished, he he was right because he said, I have opened up a door. I have allowed time for those that don't want me. I have sprinkled the universe. I have sprinkled the earth with my grace. Even those that are wicked and witches and warlocks, even those have a chance to convert themselves to me. I'm going to give you my grace. I'm not going to save you from law and then be law that if you don't accept me, you're going to hell. He said, I'm going to give you some time. I'm going to give you some time to work out your mess. I'm going to loose my grace upon you because you ain't earning it. It is, it is my unmerited favor. Look to your neighbor and say, grace on the cross. You got to understand that God in all of his wisdom, he said, I'm going to put it, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap the perfect gifts in his body and in his body, it's going to be grace. So when the devil was doing what he was doing to him and it was spitting on him and whooping him with a cat of nine's tail and grace was hidden. Now I got a little ahead of myself, but see, grace was hiding in the wound of Mary. Uh-huh. Mary said, be it unto me according to thy word. But what she didn't realize, she was having a man child, but with the man child, the man child was carrying grace. You may be pregnant, but what is your son pregnant with? You may have a baby, but what do your baby have? You looking on the outside, but God says, I have put something on the inside. You carrying a baby, but what the baby carrying? Mary was carrying baby Jesus, but baby Jesus was carrying grace. That's why you got to be very careful with how you treat your kids because you don't know what they are pregnant with. You don't know what's on the inside of them. And whomever the enemy attacked the most, you thinking he's attacking you, but he's attacking what's inside of you. He's trying to shut down what God has put in you. 
You thinking it's your mama and them, your daddy and them. You thinking it's all about them and you. But no, the enemy don't just attack a mess. When he's attacking, he's attacking the best that God has put into you. And what he really wants you to do is to self-sabotage yourself. And that's why God gave us the antivirus. His name is Yeshua Messiah. It is Jesus the Christ, the anointed one. So Mary walking around with grace in a womb. Help us, Holy Ghost. You thought it was just Jesus on the cross, but no, it's deeper than that. The revelation is it was grace in him. Then the angel Gabriel, you know what he said. He said, you're going to have a child. She said, be it unto me according to thy word. But then grace was hidden, hidden with the babe in the manger. That's why you got to be careful when you look at these little babies. Because you polluted and your life is a mess. Don't mess theirs up. You don't know what your son or your daughter is carrying. Yeah, they babies now, but they can act out and be what God needed them to be. So Mary had the babe in the manger, but even Mary didn't know that he had the grace. You see, sometimes God will keep things from your parents about you because if they knew some parents are so crazy in the head, they can mess your grace up what God needs for you to do. So God will keep it hidden. Look to your neighbor and say, it's hiding in me. And then when God will reveal it, it'll, he'll reveal it. And no one gets the credit but God. Grace was in the manger with baby Jesus. And we know it didn't stop there. Grace also was on the cross. You've heard me share it earlier. If the enemy had known that by killing Jesus that he would literally be given license for the whole world to be saved. He was literally opening up the door for those that accept Yeshua Messiah. For those that accept Jesus will have right to everlasting life. Jesus would have never been killed. The enemy thought it was a one time thing. That it was a one up thing. He thought that if I kill him that's it. Not knowing that in his death, he released his grace. The beauty of it is, is that even the, even the apostles and the 12 disciples didn't know. He didn't even reveal it to them. They didn't know. They were still operating under the law. But what I love about God, help us Holy Ghost. You see, sometimes we think we it, but God said, no, you're not it. And the reason why you're not it is because you're not committed to it. God went all the way and found the man by the name of Saul. Saul had natural attributes. He was educated. He spoke seven languages fluently. But he was a murderer of Christians. He was one that would lock them up and he was one that would help them also to be fed to lions. He was one that was rounding them up. He was one that was doing all kind of wicked things against the children of God. And God looked through his microscope and saw Saul's heart and saw that whatever Saul was in, Saul was in. Saul was committed to the Roman government to carry out the very deeds that his ruler told him to carry out. God says, if I can flip him, I can use him for my kingdom. And many times God would take the very ones that you think that are the most greatest heathens, the killers, the throat cutters, the gang bangers, the liars, the cheat. What I love about God, he said, be ye cold or hot. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. 
God does not want casual Christians. God does not want Christians that checks the box. God does not want Christians that will do it for a minute and get tired and quit. He's looking for some soldiers. He's looking for some warriors that have sold out. He's looking for some people that have made it up in their mind that for God I live, for God I die. From the womb to the tomb, I'm in it to win it. And he discovers that through how you live in the world. If you're weak in the world, you're going to bring that same weakness to the church. If you're scared in the world, you're going to bring that same fear to the church. If you are chump in the world, you're going to bring that same chump to the church. So he bypassed everybody. And he said, I want Saul. And he went down and got Saul. And you know the rest of the story. But grace not only was on the cross, grace was hidden in the tomb for three days and three nights. Hmm. See, many times when God wants to do something with you, he likes to hide you. You worrying about my time for God's favor, my time to be blessed, and God says not yet. See, he liked to hide you. See, God liked to prove you first before he, pre before he presents you. Because if he presents you and you haven't been proven, you're going to make a mess of it. So grace was hiding in the tomb for three days and three nights. Then grace resurrected from the dead. And what the people couldn't understand was that we thought we killed him. But God says, no, what you did was open up the door. So when Jesus said it's finished, he said, my whole work is finished on the earth. Anyone that's on the earth now can be saved. One died for all. And all should be willing to die for him. He said, your life is not your life. That your life now belongs to Christ. You should live your life for Christ. You're living your life in him for him. But most people don't want to do that because they don't understand that when he gave it up, he gave it up to release his grace. Well, the church said grace on the cross. Grace was in the tomb for three days and three nights. And, and while being in the tomb, grace resurrected from the dead. Yeah, you thought it was Jesus' body just got it from the dead. But it was not just his body that got up from the dead. It was grace. That's why Jesus could tell Paul, my grace is sufficient. He said, there's nothing you can do, nothing you can go through, nothing that can come upon you where my grace won't help you. My grace is sufficient. That means you have unmerited, unearned favor that comes from God to help you to live out a Christian life for God. So the whole thing was about making you ready for his grace. When you accept Yeshua Messiah, you receive his grace. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the gospel of grace. When Jesus was resurrected from the dead, there are many that didn't believe him. The women came to the tomb and said, he is risen. The angels said, why, ye, why seek ye the living among the dead? How many believers today that still don't believe that Jesus was risen from the dead? And the way the world going now, they'll call that fake news. Not good news, but fake news because most people have a problem with something that they don't understand. That's why the only way to God is to believe. He who believes that Jesus was raised from the dead received the benefits of the kingdom. If you don't believe, it's amazing that God only give one word, believe. If you confess with your mouth and believe in thine heart that God has risen from the dead, thou shalt be saved. The undercurrent is that and believe in thine heart. 
All of the other words are kind of like out front. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Believing, if I don't believe, nothing works for me. You can't even move in God's grace without believing that you're under his grace and his grace is for you. So he rose from the dead. Three days and three nights. He got up from the dead. When he got up from the dead, he's walking with some of his disciples and they didn't know that he was walking with them because sometimes uh, if you're not careful, your eyes can get blinded. You can have eyes but cannot see. You know, they was blinded to the fact that Yeshua was walking with them. And they still didn't know that grace was by their side. But he didn't stop there. What I love about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that he walked the earth for 40 days and 40 nights after his resurrection. That means that he saw people that probably spit on him. That means that he saw people that probably talked about him. That means that he saw some of the rulers. That means that he saw some of those believers, those unbelieving believers that was there. And, and even when he saw his apostles, you would think, or his disciples, you would think that if they believed that he was going to raise from the dead, you would think that they would be waiting by the tomb. Faith without works is dead. If they really believe it, they could have been hiding in the bushes somewhere, or hiding somewhere, waiting on him to come out, but there was nowhere to be found. So people can say they believe in God, but where you at? People can say they love God, but where you at? You see, it's important for us to have the corresponding action of our faith. You either believe in or you don't. 40 days and 40 nights. Seen by over 500 brethren. This is grace. Wrapped up in Yeshua. How many of you that when somebody asks you to come over and, and you don't know what they're going to bring, but they bring something that you really like? Grace is what the world really likes. That Yeshua Messiah had in him before he died. He brought it through law to give to us its amazing grace. Grace ascended into heaven. Grace poured out the Holy Spirit and grace made known the revelation of the mystery about his grace to Paul. What blew me away while receiving this revelation and understanding this is that God didn't share it with anybody else. You don't hear the 12 disciples talking about grace. You don't hear Moses and all of them talking about it and specifically to, to keep you from doing wrong. Grace is a teacher. You don't, hear, you don't hear about that, but he put it in the one that everybody thought should have been murdered. He put it in Paul. See, God knows he who has received the most grace is he who will tell others about his grace. You see, you can't talk about some things until you've been through some things. You cannot teach me what you have not learned and you cannot take me where you have not been. And if you're trying to convince me that you'll say who you are, all you're demonstrating to me is that you don't know what you're talking about. God gave his amazing grace to Paul. So while Paul was teaching the word of God, he would not feel guilty about what he had done in the past. See, grace will wash your soul clean. Grace 
will restore you. And that's why Jesus had to take the package to the cross. And that's why when he was on the cross, you looked at the man, but you did not see what was inside of the man. And that was grace on the cross that when he died, he released his grace for you and I that we may have a right to everlasting life. Will the church say grace on the cross? It's important for you to know Grace ascended into heaven and poured out grace and more grace in the mystery to Paul. Grace is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. You don't have to worry about God does not love you because he, he has proven it all the way through. You don't have to worry about Wearing all these beads and wearing all these stains on your head and knots and stuff around your neck and all that's at the cross. You don't have to worry about trying to do something because it's already been done. Christianity is a way of life where those that are Christ followers do not have to worry about what they can do because it's already finished. All other religion move upon what they can do. From putting dots on their foreheads to walking around serving Buddha and many other religiosities is all about what they can do, not what has been done. God has made it super simple for us that are believers because all we have to do is operate in one thing. And that one thing is faith. Everything you want comes through faith. Whatever you need comes through faith. God doesn't send us to India. He doesn't send us to Asia and have us to walk 40, 50 miles up a mountain. And when we get to the top that now everything in our life is good. No, once you accept Yeshua, you receive his grace. And once you receive his grace, all you have to do is to believe. Look to your neighbor and say, I believe. Can you say grace on the cross? After grace ascended, grace fulfilled the law and the prophets. The resurrection of Yeshua Messiah was the resurrection of God's grace before man sinned. What I want you to understand, God says, I'm going to take you back before the sin. You see, God didn't change. Man caused him to change. God was still operating in grace in the book of Exodus. God says, I don't want to punish them because the latter kill it. He said, I'm going to operate in my grace. But since, you know, how some people, you can give them a break at the break at the break at the break. And they still like a fool. There's some people, your, uh, the people that you pay your light bill on, they can say, we're going to give you another 30 days, and you still come up with another excuse. We're going to give you another. And sooner or later, you come home and your light's off. That's why the word of God tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, it says, shall we continue in sin that in grace may abound? It says, God forbid. But the children of Israel didn't want to listen to God in Exodus 19 and 8. It said that all that the Lord asked of us, we will do. And God says, you want law? I'm going to give you law. And they was dying everywhere, falling dead because they was, couldn't keep something that they thought they could keep. So the resurrection of Yeshua Messiah was a resurrection of God's grace before man's sin and before law. There was grace before law. And God loved man so much until he brought that grace through 13 covenants. He brought that grace and placed that grace on the cross with Yeshua Messiah. God says, I'm taking you back to where you was. And as I close, we now live in the grace of God. That is no longer on the cross. Titus tell us this. Titus 2 and 11. 
It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. You see, grace on the cross give you liberty to live for Christ, but grace off the cross give you greater liberty to live for Christ where you shall not be fooled by this present world. When you fall down, all you have to do is get back up. When you see yourself in a mess, all you have to know is that the grace of God will keep you. When you find yourself being discontent or worrying or stress, all you got to know that grace came to the cross and not only did it come to the cross, it spread it out all over the world that no man or woman shall be lost. That same grace that God put on the cross, he got for you off the cross. And all you have to do is accept Yeshua Messiah as your personal savior. Accept Yeshua Messiah as your leader, your God. Accept Yeshua Messiah as the one that can bring you out. And when you know that Yeshua Messiah came as the grace on the cross to die for your sin, you now have right to everlasting life. That is the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was the grace of God that was in him to save men from their sins. You have to understand that the resurrection was releasing the grace. The cross was releasing the grace to all men and to all women. When you accept Jesus as your personal savior, you're saying you receive his grace. And when you receive his grace, there should be corresponding action for you that you should be willing and able and ready to live out that powerful grace that was on the cross, now off the cross, to work on your behalf. If you can receive it and believe it, Give God a hand praise in the house of God. Grace.